Why is it that most people are exclusively attracted to the opposite sex and find the same gender undesirable as a romantic partner? Did biology shape these preferences? Did society? Both? Why should we care? I'm not sure I'll have an answer for you by the end of this talk, but what I hope to do is expand your mind on factors that drive the object of someone's affection and arousal that goes beyond what you may have learned in life or perhaps even what you know for yourself to be true as you watch and listen to me tell a story. This story starts with a young boy growing up with working class parents in the desert of Yucca Valley, California in the early 1980s. Of course, <laughs> this boy is me. My father had a passion for bowling. Yes, bowling. My mother worked as a waitress and attended a local community college, earning credits toward a degree in early childhood education. I grew up in bowling alleys. In fact, before I went to college, my father wanted me to follow in his footsteps to become a professional bowler too. I was good at bowling, but not good enough to compete on a national level. My interests were of a different kind. Growing up in the desert, there were many animals to engage with because after all, it was the desert. There wasn't a whole lot to do besides go outside to explore and play. Here's where I found my first obsession, ants. I became fascinated with this rich social lives of this small creature. I wanted to know absolutely everything. Why was there only one queen and so many workers? How did they communicate? Why were some fighting, some foraging, others mating? These questions on how animals relate to one another began to spread to all areas of my life. Now, when playing with my younger sister, Ken and Barbie had elaborate social lives too. But so did Ken and Ken, Barbie and Barbie, and the thruple, Ken, Barbie, and Ken. Little did I know at the time, but this deep curiosity for behavior would later drive my motivations professionally. In fact, for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, my parents divorced when I was 12 years old and my mother relocated my sister and I to Alpena, Michigan, a rural part of the Midwest. As an outsider, husky, gender non-conforming teenager, life in middle and high school wasn't too easy. I was bullied for being overweight and acting effeminate or gay, as many would yell in the hallways when I walked to class. So naturally, like any young teenager would, I buried my head in books and surrounded myself with a few positive friends who allowed me to express myself in the way I felt comfortable. My AP biology and AP psychology teachers actually a husband and wife team, noticed that same curiosity I expressed when I was a young boy growing up in the desert of Southern California. They encouraged me to apply to college, and so I did. I attended Michigan State University, and there my life really changed forever. In Lansing, I met two professors that helped mold me into the scientist, teacher, and human being I am today. I also came out first as gay, and then later in life as bisexual. Being a sexual minority in academia has posed many challenges of the course of my career, but also many opportunities. Being vocal about my personal life has allowed other silent voices to feel empowered and not ashamed to talk casually about their romantic lives. Why would it? We shouldn't stay hidden in a closet. As my curiosity developed in college, I became fascinated by model organisms to now study the neuroscience of social behavior. So I chose to attend graduate school all the way down in the panhandle of Tallahassee, Florida at Florida State University, where I studied the brains of a socially monogamous rodent, this little field mouse, the prairie vole. In the wild, when a male and female mate, they generally mate for life. And this pair bond can be experimentally manipulated in the lab and its associated neural functioning dissected. While working with this species in graduate school, I discovered a neurochemical microcircuit that regulates decision-making in the brain. 
three neurotransmitter systems, vasopressin, an antidiuretic hormone, a stress peptide, corticotropin-releasing hormone, also known as CRH, and serotonin, a mood-stabilizing molecule, work in concert with one another to facilitate decisions about whether a conspecific animal is a familiar partner or unfamiliar stranger. Parabonding experience in this species creates a neuroplastic reorganization of the brain circuits that programs these behaviors, affiliation and aggression. It was this line of curiosity investigating the neurobiology of aggression, which brings us to the last chapter of this story, when I located to Boston, Massachusetts, where I've spent the past 10 years researching and teaching using fruit flies, yes, fruit flies, mice, rats, to ask similar questions about how the nervous system develops to control sexually dimorphic social behavior. Today, you can now find me teaching popular courses like Sex and Aggression, a pretty taboo class, and labs such as Principles of Neuroscience, where we use fruit flies to dissect the nervous system and how it relates to sex behavior. This curriculum helps us to try to understand some of the original questions about behavior that fascinated three-year-old Kyle back in the desert. My students often ask, Dr. G, how do you accomplish so much with so little and appear unscathed? My response is, I like to think of myself as being forged in the fires of adversity. Despite growing up with many obstacles, some of which I still struggle with even to today, I know one thing is certain. My obsessive curiosity is my superpower, and it's not going away anytime soon, not until the day I die. And no one or any life circumstance, positive or negative, will ever take that unique part of who I am out. I hope your superpower never dims either. Thanks for listening to my story. Now go share yours.